Okay, in the second part of competition, monopoly, and profit, we're going to talk about, well, monopoly. So, what, is, what do we mean by monopoly? Uh, certainly, you've heard the term before. There's the famous game monopoly. But in economics, what do we sort of think about when, we're, when we say the word monopoly? Well, it turns out that market economies sometimes have cases where there's not much competition, right? And there could be a number of reasons for that. But we call it a case where we only have a single seller of a good or a service. We call that a monopoly, right? In, in a sense, it's sort of an absence of other competition, OK? So the characteristics of monopoly or a market that we would sort of call a monopoly market is one in which is, as I said, is basically the opposite of competition. We have high prices, high costs, low quality, and it's, of course, less responsive to consumers, right? It's not exactly zero response to consumers because consumers can just also not buy what the monopoly is selling, right? That's always an option, right? But because they don't have other alternatives, since it's the only seller of a particular product or service, right? You're generally going to have poor customer service or poor customer responsiveness, right? Sometimes we think of the local cable company, right? in cases where you only have one option to buy cable or one option for telephone, right? This is, you know, an example of a monopoly. Now, historically, it wasn't easy for cable companies to, to wire an entire neighborhood, right? So they had all these fixed costs associated with putting in the lines and so forth. And so as a result, only one cable company would serve a particular neighborhood. Now, more recently, that's become less of an issue, right? There are other options for sort of cutting the cord. You can get streaming uh, cable and streaming services that closely approximate what cable does. But it might be the case for your, your internet. You might not have a lot of options for at least high speed internet. And so cable might be your one option for that. Um, telephone is becoming less of an issue. So historically, when people had landlines, you could only have one telephone company serve you. But since we have more reliance on mobile phones, that's become a bit less of an issue. But historically, you can see these as examples of a case where if you want a particular service, if you want a particular good, you may only have one option for that. But what do we associate with those things? Well, we associate, we, we generally associate the, the kinds of things, low, uh, the high prices, low quality, and all of that with those particular services. Now sometimes businesses try to collude, right, in order to keep or maintain prices to be high, just like a monopoly could charge more than a, than a competitive firm because there's no sort of outside option here. It's the same case that if companies collude with one another, they could potentially try to act like they're a single seller. So for example, suppose Coke and Pepsi decide to get together and set the prices of soft drinks to, let's say, $5 a can, right? They had the really high price. In effect, since they dominate the market, they're essentially acting as if they're the one seller in the market by colluding and not providing customers with that op outside option of having that competitor. Now, of course, again, there are limits to how much they can charge based on what economists call elasticity of demand or how sensitive people are to price changes. Right? And so if consumers are very sensitive to price changes, they still may cut back anyways. Right? So there's sort of limits to how much they can do this. But for the most part, if there's less competition, they can up that price at least a little bit. So businesses that successfully collude, right? they can act as if they're a monopoly. They can charge these higher prices. They don't have to worry so much about quality. And in some cases, right? or at least in most cases, governments try to prevent, at least in market economies, they try to prevent businesses from doing these things. But there are some market forces still at play with collusion, right? So if businesses try to get together and they try to collude, there's still competitive forces there that might make it difficult for them to collude. Why? Well, suppose Coke and Pepsi, they get together and they try to charge five bucks a can. What Coke has the incentive to do is to try, they have an incentive to cheat and actually sell their sodas for a little bit less. Or maybe they cheat in other dimensions, 
right? So maybe they make their cans a little bit smaller, right? Maybe that's not really noticeable. They make them, they, they make them thin or something like that so that they're actually selling, um, I'm sorry, they make their cans a little bit bigger so it looks more attractive to, um, to buying the Coke than the Pepsi, right? So they may try to undercut this colluding agreement in some way because there is an interest, there's a demand from, from customers to do that, right? And so it's always profitable to say that you're going to collude, but then actually cheat, right? This is sort of the gaming of, uh, sort of the, the gaming uh, equilibrium here. And so Pepsi is going to respond, and ultimately, as they sort of try to cheat, even though they say they're colluding, they're going to get these competitive forces to effectively satisfy the customers and get what the customers want. Now, other businesses may also enter the soft drink business while Pepsi and Coke are trying to collude. That's another market force that's going to undercut this potential for collusion. So if, for example, another uh, soft drink company pops up and they said, well, we're not going to offer uh, you know, a, a can of soda for $4. We'll offer it for $2, right? That's, that's going to mean that this collusion deal is going to completely fall apart because everybody's going to want to buy a soda that's much, much more reasonably priced than whatever Pepsi and Coke try to set up their price, even if it's like not the same substitute, even if like RC Cola, you don't really like RC Cola that much, but the fact that it's so much cheaper, that's going to induce you to, to enter or to, uh, um, to switch over to that, right? Ultimately, collusion falls apart where there's free entry. So essentially if, um, if competitive firms want to act and try to get together and try to act like a monopoly, if, there are, if there's free entry into this, that's going to completely fall apart. So whether it's cheating or whether it's entry into the, in, into the market, you're going to get these market forces that will try to sort of uh, you know, pick apart this monopoly power that they're trying to gain. And this also comes with an additional lesson here. Businesses are always going to try to seek becoming a monopoly or seek collusion because ultimately what they want is higher prices and they don't want to cut their, their costs and they don't, they'd, they'd rather not you know, be efficient. Right? Because being efficient is hard. Right? Always trying to think about and obsessing over your customers and what they want, that takes a lot of time, effort, and energy. Right? Sitting back and just, just taking in a, co you know, a, a, a constant stream of cash, that's a great deal for businesses. And all businesses want that. Right? And so businesses hate competition. Right? Some people thrive on competition, but for the most part, your natural human tendency is just sit, to sit back and sort of live the good life. Consumers love competition, right? Because that's, that's the, what forces them to get these good outcomes. So because of this sort of friction, businesses will try to do whatever they can to try to get whatever edge that they can get. And one of the ways that they can do that is to try to lobby government to, to sort of help them out. So what kinds of things do businesses or have businesses done in the past? Well, in some cases, businesses actually invite regulation. They invite the government to make rules that make it easier for them to comply to than their competitors or potential competitors or potentially even prevent people from entering particular markets. Right? This is something that happened prior to the 1980s, the 1970s, and so forth. Um, you had a very highly regulated airline industry such that the... Um, the, the government said, you know, you have to charge a certain price for a certain fare, and they regulated quality, they regulated all sorts of things about the airline industry, and airline prices were very high, and they also forbid airlines from charging lower prices and higher quality, right? They forbid airlines from entering markets um, in order to sort of... Uh, um, provide sort of more market power for the existing airlines, okay? That may not have been their exact justification, but that's effectively what happened. So that's not to say that all regulation is anti-competitive. In some of the cases it is, in some of the cases it's not, right? Some regulations have this effect. Other cases they try to make the market more efficient and more competitive, right? But the thing that we have to understand is we have to think through all of the intended and unintended consequences of the regulations. 
right? Regulations can be costly to comply with. They can give bigger businesses an edge to deter new entry into the market. If the regulation is very costly to comply with, for example, let's go to this previous example. Suppose there was this huge regulation for in the soda industry so that if you came out with a new soda, you had to make sure that it was healthy for people or, or it was safe to drink. And as part of this safety, let's say you had to go through this, um, you know, this, this very expensive process to, you know, um, you know, make sure that it was, it was safe, which sounds really nice, but let's say you had to go through a randomized controlled trial like, you know, like they do with drug trials where you have to give certain people the RC Cola and certain people the Coke and see if their health is, is different, right? And you have to go through all these stringent things that people normally don't have to do, but if you made these regulations in the name of safety, what in effect that would do is it would keep competitors like RC Cola out of the market. Even if you say it's for safety purposes, right? Safety purposes is sort of the stated justification, right? So when thinking through regulations, you also have to think through, well, what are the costs? And are these costs going to deter entry? And is this entry then going to be worth it for the benefits that we get out of this? In some cases, the answer might be yes. Maybe certain minimum safety standards and certain fixed costs and regulations are perfectly worth it because they have serious consequences for and serious benefits as a result. In other cases, they may be somewhat arbitrary and might be ways in which businesses can deter entry and deter competition so that ultimately they get more profits. The reason why we need to think through all these things is because ultimately we want entrepreneurs to figure out what consumers want. We want entrepreneurs to focus on that problem. At least economists would much rather entrepreneurs focus on uh, providing better products, providing higher quality, and focusing on what co consumers want, maybe even before the consumers know, right? Rather than focusing their efforts on how do we get the optimal amount of regulations that give us the sort of sweet spot in terms of deterring competition, but also making it seem like we're, you know, bettering, you know, consumers and so forth, okay? When they focus on that stuff, when they focus on what consumers want, sometimes they even figure out, in, in certain rare cases, they figure out what consumers want even before the consumers know, right? What consumers knew they needed Facebook before it even came out, right? Before social media even existed, consumers were like, well, you know, um, if, if, if uh, Zuckerberg were to pitch this idea that, hey, people are going to spend a lot of time on this service that I want to create, people would say, I, you know, I think you're dreaming. I guess you could, you know, try it and give it a shot and see if it works. Well, if, you know, if, if, it, if it is in fact useful to consumers, that's exactly, uh, then th these are the, sort of the exact sort of things that will be very successful, okay? So ideally we get our, our folks, our entrepreneurs, focus on the problems that consumers have and as they solve some of these problems, as they make useful products, right, as they invent new things and find ways to make things better, right, these are the countless hours that we want our people to focus on so that they can make better stuff for us, ideally, which will work out very well, and so that we can sort of advance as, as our economy, and people can get really rich in the process do, of doing this, right, in a very much a win-win sort of way, right, in a competitive economy or a competitive outcome rather than this sort of monopolistic win-lose or at least win and not win so much kind of outcome.